Hello and welcome to a bonus episode of Anthology presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. If this is your first time listening, Anthology is one man's examination of the Twilight Zone as a first time viewer. Each podcast I share my first impressions, analysis, and overall thoughts on Rod Serling's iconic series one episode at a time. I also cover modern anthology science fiction shows such as Black Mirror and the upcoming Jordan Peele Twilight Zone reboot in bonus episode review series. which this is one of those review series. (laughs) You can find more of Anthology as well as a full episode archive at anthologypod.com. And if you want to contact me, you can use the Facebook page at facebook.com slash anthologypod, tweet me at ovanthologypod, or send an email to matt at obsessiveviewer.com. Of course, if you like what you hear and you want to support the podcast please head over to iTunes and leave a rating and review. The more ratings and reviews I get, the easier it will be for my show to stand out in the crowd. And finally, if you want to show your support with your wallet, you can always donate by clicking the donate button on anthologypod.com or by visiting patreon.com slash obsessive viewer to set up recurring donations. Um, if you do that, you get access to a special RSS feed with bonus content recorded specifically for Patreon subscribers. Any donations made will help pay, pay the fees to keep the podcast running and are greatly appreciated. So, as I said before, this is a bonus episode of Anthology. Um, Today I'm going to be discussing Black Museum. It's the sixth and final episode of Black Mirror's fourth season, Bandersnatch Notwithstanding, that premiered back in December of 2017 on Netflix. Um, Of course, I'm going to be spoiling the entire episode, so uh, if you haven't seen Black Museum, uh, go check it out on Netflix and come back and listen to my review. So, as always, I'll start with a plot description, courtesy of IMDb, for a black museum. Uh, quote, on a dusty stretch of highway, a traveler stumbles upon a museum that boasts rare criminal artifacts and a disturbing main attraction. Uh, starring in this episode is Letitia Wright as Nish, which is Nish or Nish? I can't remember exactly what it is. I hope it's Nish, because that's what I'm going to be saying throughout this entire episode. Uh, she is best known, perhaps best known for her role as Shuri in uh, Black Panther, Avengers Infinity War, and this year's Avengers Endgame. Um, total scene stealer in Black Panther. Like, she's fantastic in that movie. Um, she also appeared recently in The Commuter and in Ready Player One. And co-starring in this episode is Douglas Hodge as Rollo Haynes. He was previously in uh, Red Sparrow recently, and he's going to be in the upcoming movie The Report. And he's also going to be playing, oddly enough, uh, Alfred in Todd Phillips, uh, Todd Phillips's Joker movie that's coming out later this year with Joaquin Phoenix as Joker. Um, so yeah, uh, this was both of their first episodes of Black Mirror, and this episode was written by Charlie Brooker, uh, part, part of it was based on, uh, a story by Penn Gillette called Pain Addict, so one of the stories is based on that, uh, Gillette had actually written the story based on the personal, based, based on a personal experience he had where he was, uh, sick in a Spanish welfare hospital back in 1981, and he had a lot of difficulty, like, explaining his ailments to the doctors because of the language barrier. And so he published a story, uh, published it as a short story in an anthology called Would, Could, Should. And uh, he'd been trying to shop for a better venue, um, then eventually brought it up to uh, Charlie Brooker when he met him, I guess, or had the opportunity to chat with Charlie Brooker. And then that's how that kind of came about to being to being included in this uh kind of anthology within an anthology episode of Black Mirror. Uh director for this episode was Colm McCarthy. Uh this is his only Black Pan- or Black Panther. This is his only Black Mirror episode. He recently directed the uh genre movie The Girl with All the Gifts, which I haven't seen. Uh he's also got a ton of British uh, television credits, so check that out on IMDb and check out some of his work. So I'm going to go spoilers on for Black Museum, and here we go with my review. Um, I'm going to start off with my initial thoughts on the episode. Kind of overall, kind of overall um, thoughts is that it's just, it's obviously it's similar in structure to White Christmas in the way that it tells three stories with a frame story that runs throughout. Um, 
But in this case, like, okay, White Christmas was, was a great episode. The Christmas special with Rafe Spall and John Hamm. It was fantastic, and it tied everything together really well, I thought. And what Black Museum... It seems like Black Museum is attempting to do that same kind of thing, but I don't think the stories quite connect with each other the way that White Christmas... Uh, the White Christmas vi- vignettes do. Um, this is still a good episode. Black Museum is still a, a good episode and very disturbing in, in a lot of places. Um, and I really think that Douglas Hodge is the standout as Rollo Haynes. He's just so sniveling and just, just un- unnerving. Like there's something about his energy that just really cr- like crawls under your skin. Um, all that's great. I just don't think it had the, um, panache of, white Christmas, like that kind of sense of like cleverness is the best way I could describe it. Uh, the way that it cleverly ties everything together. Um, black museum doesn't really, doesn't really achieve that. Um, so let's go into my review. I'm kind of going to kind of break this up into segments because, uh, clearly the way the episode structured is that there's a frame story and then there are three short stories, one right after the other. So I'm going to go, piece by piece through each story and the frame story. So let's start with the frame story, the at least the beginning of it, the introduction of the frame story. Um, right off the bat, I really like the use of Always Something There to Remind Me, the song. And uh, I really like the way that that's paid off at the end. I think that that was really, really clever. I talked earlier in another episode, um, I think it was my review of Archangel, about how it seemed like they were trying to recreate the magic of using heaven as a place on earth at the end of, um, San Junipero by using licensed music as the end of the episode. And they did the same thing in, um, hang the DJ as well. Um, here I think is where it works best, or I should say it works as close to, as close to perfectly as San Junipero's did as, as the show will ever get. Like it's, it's not as, as perfect as that. Cause you can't get, you can't get better than heaven is a place on earth for an episode like San Junipero. You just can't top that. But this comes, this comes kind of close. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So we are introduced to, uh, Nish as she is driving across a desolate desert highway and right off the bat, I really like the retro look of the car, like kind of uh, contrast that with um, the episode Nosedive and how uh, uh, it was Bryce Dallas Howard. Yeah, how Bryce Dallas Howard has to uh, kind of slum it with a rental rental car like this. This is more of a retro type of car that looks like it's been kept up well and it's kind of a kind of a classic but still futuristic as she takes out the solar panels to have a charge and everything. And the, what I noticed upon rewatching this is that when she stops and she gets out of the car and she looks she sees the black museum, she just all you hear is she just says, "Mhm." And like it's just it's cool to go back and rewatch that because it's clearly she's, you know, responding to something her mother says in her in her mind. And so she's introduced to, uh, Rollo Haynes and this guy, like Rollo Haynes as a character is maybe like he is, he's catapulted himself to being one of my favorite Black Mirror characters, like across the board. (laughs) He's just so slimy and skeezy and just, just scummy. He's, he's a scummy guy in a scummy business and he is relishing it in a weird, in a weird way. I'll, I'll, talk about that in a bit but um there's this this kind of like and it's also because you know nish took out the air conditioning but he's throughout the episode he gets progressively more like sweaty and uh exasperated as he's telling these stories and it's because the air conditioning's out so he's obviously really hot and he's um he's uh dehydrated and everything but it comes across as this weird like a weird, almost erotic kind of, um, or, or almost, almost sensual kind of glee that he has 
uh, as he goes to these different exhibits and everything. It's just so unnerving and just, just gross. And it, it works really great for the episode, um, in terms of making it disturbing. So the frame story is about the best place to talk about this. And I've talked about this particular thing in earlier episodes of this review series, but the Easter eggs to past episodes, like, I don't, I don't know. I think in this episode, I think they're fine. Um, it's kind of, uh, I don't know. It, it kind of gets on my nerves because it, it's kind of pointing at the fact that like, okay, well, this all takes place in the same universe, even though everything is, <laughs> there's so much that's contradictory to each, to other things that there's the continuity is just, you cannot figure it out. It's, it's crazy, but also, to go back, going back to like my review of Archangel, I just don't need that. I just really don't need a connected, shared universe with all of these Black Mirror episodes. I just want to see, I just want to see crazy sci-fi tech shit trying to kill us. Like, that's all I want to see. I don't need it to be this elaborate universe that's paying homage to each other every episode. Um... So I don't, I don't know, but the way that it's handled in this with the Easter eggs of like, you see like the tablet for the archangel and you see, uh, I think you see a white bear mask and, uh, you see a bunch of other stuff that's, that's clearly like referencing other episodes. Like it's directly responsible. Like they even reference like cookies and everything and the technology is kind of circular again, which is a kind of a, something that's sticks out to me in a negative way always, um, in the show. And it's, it sticks out somewhat negatively here. It's not as bad as say how I felt about USS Callister and some of the other depictions of technology in the, in the, uh, series, but it's still, it's still kind of circular in, in, uh, in its storytelling. So we get to the first story and Rollo Haynes is basically the premise of the frame story is that Rollo, Rollo Haynes is guiding Nish through the museum as she's waiting for her car to charge. So the first, the first story is the one that was, uh, written or co-written or story by, um, Penn Jillette. It's the pain addict. And it's interesting because just recently within the past few weeks, I saw a movie from, I think it was 89 or 86. I think it was 86. Um, called Strange Days, directed by Catherine Bigelow. And it, that movie has a lot of similar kind of, uh, <laughs> technology as this, this story. So I, I think it's just kind of interesting when, um, you get different people creating similar, um, uh, sim- similar technology and, and storytelling. Oh, it was from 1995, but I think, I think James Cameron wrote the script or came up with the idea in the eighties or something. Um, fun fact about strange days though. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the line in, in that fat boy slim song where, uh, where, where it says right here, right now, uh, that the line that he sampled that from is from dialogue in strange days. So like there's a scene in strange days where I think it's Angela Bassett, uh, tells Ralph Fiennes right here, right now is where your life is or whatever. And then like th- that exact, like her saying right here, right now is what is in the fat boy slim song. Anyway, I'm getting away from this. So the pain addict, uh, the, w- the first thing that really stood out to me was that, um, the TCKR, I, uh, or the research and development, I don't know if it was TCKR at that point in the story, I don't remember, but, um, that Rollo Haynes is working for, like the kind of, uh, guinea pig kind of thing that he's, he's doing is, uh, kind of dark and kind of tragic, I would say. Um, the whole way that he sets it up is that they offer free healthcare in exchange for, people being guinea pigs for their little experiments and their technology, which I think is just a really sad commentary. Um, I know that if I didn't have health insurance, I would <laughs> freak out and probably be willing to do some things that are morally questionable in the realm of science if it meant free health care. And it sucks because I'm someone who thinks that, you know, it would be nice if, you know, 
I didn't have to worry about <laughs> uh, the expenses of getting my gallbladder taken out when I had like the most intense pain of my life, but whatever. Anyway, um, the premise of experiencing another person's pain in order to diagnose illnesses is so interesting to me. And I like, I like it a lot as a concept. And I think that it fits into Black Mirror's world very well. However, I really wish that this would have been explored more. Like, I think that this type of premise, this story, this idea has the legs to carry its own Black Mirror episode or its own, um, feature film, honestly, because I, there are so many different things that you can do with this premise. And it's, it's so it's so interesting to me that if it was done right, you could get a lot of mileage out of it. Um, but for what for what it's utilized here, it works very well. And even though it's kind of a truncated time frame and everything, I think it still gets the story across really well, and it's done really well. Um, I like Doctor Dawson as as a character, um, in his growth as a character, his, his descent into, uh, depravity and craziness. Um, it's kind of, it's a gradual decline. Like he is kind of getting addicted to this feeling of experience, other people's pains. It's almost a sexual thing. And then he even uses it for sex with his girlfriend, uh, which I thought was really interesting, (laughs) a really interesting kind of plot development. Um, and then I had completely forgotten that he experiences death um, with the patient. Like he, like the patient dies while he's trying to diagnose her with the headset thing. And uh, I just think that's such an incredible wrinkle to the story. Like that's such an incredible way to kind of usher us into the next stage of the story. And I love that it's kind of turns into the story of, essentially a super villain or super killer origin story. Like I could see just a really interesting, like I would watch like a seven esque movie where like detectives are hunting down the sadistic killer who the reason that he's killing people is because he wants to experience their death as he's, you know, chopping them up and like doing just really disturbing, painful, uh, gore stuff to him. I don't know what that says about me. I, honestly, I'm, I'm pretty okay, guys. I've, I've got like, uh, I'm not that demented, but I think that it would be a very compelling thriller movie, um, in that respect. Also, the most disturbing thing about this entire episode, maybe this entire season of Black Mirror is seeing, uh, seeing the doctor cut away at himself and it's just seeing like the surgical precision that he that he has just chopped away at himself is just so like it's it's making me cringe just thinking about it because it's such a disturbing uh plot development and it's so it's done so well and it's just it it really it really grosses me out i think it was done really well in this uh in this short story Um, so that segment kind of ends with him going into a coma and it, okay. He goes into a coma. He's content. They say like the doctor say that he's, that he's happy because he has a smile on his face. And then, and then you see he has this massive erection, um, that I thought was going a little too far. And then as soon as we get back to the frame story, Rollo Haynes is like, uh, he basically is like, I threw in the boner thing. I don't know about that or whatever. Um, I thought that was a, that was a nice touch. Okay. So the next story is the monkey. And right off the bat, the first thing I want to say is that the line that Rollo Haynes says when he talks about how, um, Jack and Carrie, uh, had a baby. He (laughs) he says, quote, he dick pukes a little baby paste up the wazoo. And that line kills me every time (laughs) because what an incredible turn of phrase. (laughs) Like I, I love it. And the way that Douglas Hodge, uh, delivers that line is just fantastic. Um, so this is all, we're getting backstory of, of Jack and Carrie and how they had a baby and they're, they're a happy couple and everything. And then boom, Carrie gets just destroyed by a van and it's so sudden and it's incredibly violent. Um, 
just I, it, it kind of came out of nowhere. Um, and we kind of get this. I don't want to say rehash because that's that's a little too uh, diminutive, diminutive of of it, or uh, what's what I'm looking for? Reductive of it, I guess. Um, that it's something of a rehash of like what we saw in White Christmas with the cookies and having people in like a stationary like place. Like I think in White Christmas when we get John Hamm um interacting with the consciousness and the cookie of the woman in the house and how he's explaining that, you know, what she does is she just cleans and everything. So that's that's her purpose. Um and there's nothing like she has no no purpose other than that. This is the same exact technology, except that they're putting a person in another person's consciousness. And I just think that Again, that, that kind of just, it kind of rubs me the wrong, I don't know if rubs me the wrong way is the right way to put it, but it kind of just doesn't really mesh well with me because it's just rehashing established technology in, in this, in this series. And I don't know, maybe it's because we're four seasons into this show that, I mean, maybe that's, maybe that's why they're doing that because it's an established property now. They are paying homage to past episodes. They're kind of giving, you know, fanboys their easter eggs and everything but at the end of the day i just want more elaborate tech crap um <laughs> like i want more unique technology and and this is just kind of not doing it for me um i do think that it's it's really interesting how this episode depicts that this is this aired in december of 2017 and then in february of 2018 we got get out which has the uh, sunken place which is uh, visually represented uh both this episode of black mirror and get out uh represent their different uh consciousness kind of creepy crazy stuff and with the same visual flair so i thought that was interesting like the sunken place has a similar visual aesthetic to the uh consciousness thing uh that carrie is put into in uh jack's head and it's not like it's not i'm not claiming like oh oh jordan peele you know stole from it or whatever because it's literally impossible they were filming at the same time like i don't see how that could be possible at all but um i just thought that that was interesting that that's kind of where we're at um, in terms of art is that like, I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's a statement that, you know, Oh, let's just, let's just go off into our own little world. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. But anyway, this whole idea of putting another person's consciousness in your head, even if this is like the love of your life and your soulmate and, and, uh, the person that you were going to spend the rest of your life with before that was tragically cut short, all those things like, sure, great mother of your child, everything, but man, that would be so that it sounds it's still, it sounds like a freaking nightmare <laughs> because you lose all semblance of, um, of, uh, privacy. Like you cannot, you are never alone in that that would just drive me insane. And like the, I, I like that the story eventually, uh, introduces the pause function, which I thought was pretty clever and, um, a good way to add conflict to the, uh, the story without getting kind of bored with, with the plot device that they're utilizing. But it's, man, that would just, that, that just, that alone sounds terrifying to me. Just having this voice in your head that's constantly, there and like she doesn't have any anything to do either like she feels the sensations of jack's body and everything and what he does but like she doesn't have any control over him she can just talk to him and hope that he does what she says so, like i can't imagine a more um <sighs> lonely existence and it's just such a such a tragic kind of concept uh but it's all for the kid. Like, um, when they bring in Parker, the kid, after the, the consciousness has been swapped into Jack's brain, um, it's such, it's a really sweet moment when he, when he hugs him, when he hugs Parker and, uh, Carrie can feel, can feel the hug in, Jack's mind. Um, but I do want to point out that it was kind of disturbing because, like, like it's a sweet moment and it's a sweet um it's a sweet moment for all the characters but all i kept thinking was her like dead body her like actual like physical body 
is right there. <laughs> like it's, it's in the bed right next to it. She's like, she's dead. She's going to start decomposing soon. It's just, it's, I don't know. It just seemed kind of weird. Like you have this tender family moment between a father and son and the implanted consciousness of his mother in the father's head while the physical body of the mother is laying lifeless right next to them. It's just a weird juxtaposition and, and something that I kind of got a kick out of. And so again, I'm going to harp on the Easter egg thing. We see Jack, uh, reading a comic book of 15 million merits. And like in retrospect, I'm, I'm fine at this point in the story, I've made my peace with the Easter eggs and uh, like throughout the episode and like the different exhibits and everything we pass by. Cause it's fun. eye candy to point out and say, Oh, I remember this from this episode or that episode. But to have Jack reading a comic book of 15 million merits is the same kind of thing as in Archangel when they show footage from men against fire as an example of violent images. Um, like they show actual footage shot from that episode into like that, like it, all of that just doesn't mesh well with me. And when, um, and when he's reading 15 million merits, all I thought was like, okay, well if, uh, if other episodes are part of the same universe or, or whatever, then like, does that mean that 15 million merits is a fictional account? Like, is it, was it a TV show? Was it a movie? Was it a comic book that was converted into a TV show or movie? Or was a comic book made that was, um, uh, inspired by the story of being and, uh, hot shots and everything. Like, I don't, I, it just, it just raises more questions than I need to be bothered with or that I can, I can allow myself to be bothered with. And it just kind of sucks the fun out of it for me because like, Oh, Hey, I recognize 15 million merits. That's great. But that fine. I'm watching and I'm watch. I'm already watching a new episode of Black Mirror. Like I don't need callbacks to last, uh, to previous ones that are so blatantly just blatant and to an extent overkill, uh, for the fan base. I, I just don't, I don't have a need for that. So this, this story really raises some interesting questions. And it's funny because this is kind of a, I don't want to say a common theme of the season as a whole, but it's just an interesting idea uh, or it's an interesting thread that basically I want, like I found myself wondering what this family dynamic would do to that kid. Like a ima- just imagine for a second growing up and watching like throughout your formative years, your dad is the only person there. Just imagine that, Imagine that he didn't get the other girlfriend and remarry and everything. But let's just say through your formative years, your father is the only parent. But every single day, you see him interacting with nobody. <laughs> like, you see him talking to himself and arguing over his parenting, like parenting skills and parenting things. Like, it's just, I wonder what that would do to the psyche of of you as a kid. Um I just, I just think that that's kind of fascinating. And that's something that the episode didn't have time to touch on, but I think it would be interesting to revisit that kind of concept. Same as with, um, Archangel. Like I said, like what would be, what would a world, what would the world be like for a person who has had this Archangel technology in their mind and has not been able to see any sex or violence throughout their entire life. Like they have literally never experienced that or, or been exposed to that in their entire life. Like what would that do to them? Um, so that, I don't know, both of those things kind of seem like they're kind of ripe for more development and everything. And maybe down the road, they'll do something similar with those concepts, but I don't know. So as the, um, as the kind of honeymoon period of this, of this experiment, kind of expires and Jack and Carrie just get at each other's throats. Um, th- like they they just can't stand each other. The idea of, um, first of all, like being able to having Jack be able to pause is really interesting. Like in seeing it from Carrie's perspective where she's like paused for a little while and then unpaused and then boom, it's like it's months later, it's Halloween and she has no idea what's, what's been going on. Like the shock of that is just so visceral because 
all I thought during that was like, oh my God, she just missed out on three or four months of her child life. And the child is at an age where like those months count. Like those are important months in the growth of the child. And she missed it. Like she's, she missed it without even having any control over whether or not she, she was there. She did like, she didn't know that she was missing it until, until he unpaused her. And that just the shock of that was really, uh, well done and really interesting, um, as a concept for the episode. And so that was a really great development to the story. The fact that he could pause time for her and everything like it's just it's an interesting wrinkle to add to it. And then as they go to their kind of pseudo relationship um, shrink with Rollo Haynes, uh, the concept of deletion is brought up. And just the thought of that is so dark and um, it's it's kind of disturbing that like they're just sitting there talking about um basically completely i mean it's a messy gray area but it's like she ha it's it's her consciousness she, her her entire consciousness is residing within his brain and that like it's basically her without a body and they're basically talking about erasing her from his mind and thereby destroying the consciousness of her and her facilitating her death basically killing her and it's just it's really it's a really dark and kind of disturbing turn that it takes but the compromise is maybe i don't know if i'd say darker but it's much much sadder because their compromise is that they transfer her consciousness from his from uh jack's mind to a stuffed toy monkey and that is such a bad shit crazy compromise <laughs> to make and it is so sad like Oh my god and in the uh the kind of rudimentary um communication element of it where it's uh monkey loves you and monkey needs a hug it's like those are the only two things that she's capable of communicating it's just so just so messed up and it's so tragic for Carrie like <laughs> first of all first of all to go back to the thought of what that does to your uh your development as a human being as a child like think about like okay if your father was the only parent at home and he was constantly fighting with himself with an imaginary mother like an imaginary version of your mother that's in his head that you can't see and then suddenly um, and granted, they don't say this to, they don't say this to Parker or anything, but just for the sake of this, um, hypothetical, just imagine like after that, uh, your dad gives you a stuffed toy monkey and it's like, Hey, Hey, here's your mom. Your mom's in this monkey. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I don't know. That would just, that kid, uh, like I just, I want to see a different version of the story where the kid just grows up to be completely mentally just messed up because he's had such a, just a terrible life or not terrible life, but he's just had such a confusing upbringing with his parenting and everything. Um, but yeah, so that whole element is really disturbing and it's so tragic for Carrie because first she's in, she's in Jack's head, has no control besides her voice. Um, like she, like she can't control his body or anything, but she can communicate with him in a way that she could communicate before she has full, uh, communication with Jack. Um, then as her husband moves on with his life and meets someone, uh, she's paused for extended periods of time. She is taken to just having time on the weekends with their son. And then suddenly, uh, that doesn't work out either. So she is transferred into a monkey where she doesn't even have the, ability to communicate other than either saying one phrase or another phrase as like a positive or a negative. And like, that's the only form of communication she has. And it's just so, just so tragic for her because she just like her entire thing is that she loves her son. She wants to be with her son. And all I kept thinking throughout like this element of the story is that, I mean, that kid's going to get rid of the, like, like the kid's not going to have the, the, the toy monkey forever hence it being in the black museum but like just 
at some point the kid's going to discard the toy because that's what kids do. They move on to something else. Their favorite toy becomes something else in like a week or two or a month or a year even. But eventually they move on to something else. Like that's the whole point of the toy story franchise. <laughs> um, but just the fact that his mother's consciousness is in this, uh, is in this toy is just really just tragic and, and sad. And, but okay. So, but some of that tragedy and some of that, uh, sadness is undercut by the fact that, uh, so Jack's new girlfriend, uh, basically, uh, threatens the monkey and like to the point that she pushes the monkey up against the wall and like is like very aggressively threatening the monkey saying that they'll delete her and she'll be gone forever if she does anything to mess up what they've got or whatever. Um, and all, all I kept thinking through that, through that is just how hilarious is it for that actress? Like, like imagine being that actress and getting a role on black mirror and like most, like probably 40% of your role is pushing a, a stuffed monkey up against the wall and threatening it like that in terms of an acting role is just hilarious to me. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So then anyway, the, the, this storyline kind of wraps up with the revelation that, uh, Carrie is in the monkey in the black museum. And it's just, it's just, so tragic that reveal and, and just the fact that she's been in there, like not so much that, well, I, I don't know, like the idea, like it raises questions of like, okay, where's the kid? Where's, where's Jack and the new, the new girl? Like, how did she end up there? And, um, it's just really, really tragic just to think that she's been sitting in this, um, museum exhibit completely empty for a long time having no interaction or anything like i can't imagine the mental state of i can't imagine the mental state of that toy monkey anyway uh that's the second story the third one is the weather girl killer um so this one is kind of bringing everything together it's uh so it's it's about clayton lee a convicted killer and how uh, Rollo Haynes has taken his consciousness and projected it into a cell in the Black Museum, uh, where they basically, he basically charges people to re, uh, re-execute him via electric chair day in and day out. Um, very disturbing, very quick story also. This is a very, like, this is, we're getting to the climax of the story, so this is very, streamlined but it's uh it's 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 really disturbing the heinousness of Rollo Haynes and um and the spectators and everything but I do want to mention that having the easter eggs like kind of laying the groundwork for this storyline having the easter eggs throughout the other segments like we see we hear like news clippings like saying like oh Clayton Lee was arrested for this or whatever um I respect what they were going for with that but I just felt like it didn't like I didn't feel like it's it tied um tied the stories together very well at all. It just seemed like it was just kind of a thin attempt at tying everything together when it's really just another little easter egg that pays off in the third act. Um it didn't really do anything for me. Um so we see Rollo Haynes is more and more and more of just a snake. Um, he's getting like, we see a flashback of him getting Clayton's permission, uh, to essentially own his consciousness. Um, he throws up the idea of like, your, your family will be properly taken care of and everything. Uh, you just need to sign the rights over and everything. Not knowing that he is like Clayton doesn't know that he's going to be, uh, using this as a torture device for, uh, people to kind of get off on torturing this, uh, projection of this death row inmate. Um, I do want to say that I do like how the segments throughout this entire episode show the evolution of the technology. Like Dr. Dawson's implant is, it's a surgical procedure. It's very grotesque and large and it's just like, it's massive. It's a surgical procedure that cannot be undone. And it's just very, very, uh, very, um, messy. Uh, and then 
we get Jack and Carrie where they're they have those tube like uh, those tube shaped things that go into their like kind of connect to their temple and just uploads the um, or downloads whatever the consciousness into the mind and and everything. It's just it's very it's a little more refined, but you can tell like there's more pain and everything. And then by the time we get to Clayton's, um, we get the kind of refined a little disc thing that we saw in USS Callister for the infinity game where it's just like, it's stuck to his temple and it just kind of whirs up and, and, and does it that way. Um, so the idea of electrocuting Clayton or the consciousness of Clayton day in and day out is so freaking demented and disturbing. And to add insult to injury, they get a souvenir keychain that shows like it's a piece of, of, Clayton's consciousness just frozen in time at the most painful moment. And it's just, it's so disturbing and just so cruel. And so that kind of ends this story and brings us back to the frame story where we get Rolo's comeuppance and we get the, uh, reveal that, that Nish is actually, uh, Clayton's daughter and he, she's there just basically to free him or just like to, to end his pain essentially and say goodbye to him while also uh torturing Rollo Haynes in the exact same way that he tortured Clayton and it's interesting it's it's really interesting so Rollo's come up and like the idea of transferring Rollo's consciousness into Clayton's digital one and then killing him is so freaking awesome but it's also it's it's also an interesting it's also interesting in that it gives us that thrill that the characters who go to the museum get out of electrocuting Clayton like we're in their position seeing this heinous person get their come up and and it's just it's i don't know it's it's uh it's a weird feeling it's it's a weird feeling um and also when, before all that, Nish says something to the effect of that her family organized these protests and that the protesters got bored, um, got bored and went on to their next viral thing. Um, I just thought that, that was a kind of a sad commentary on, you know, social media and how, like, uh, how the cultural zeitgeist is kind of, um, bounces around a little bit. It's kind of sad. Um, so yeah, so then that's almost to the end of the episode. We get, uh, the closure of, of Nish getting her comeuppance, destroying the museum and leaving with, uh, with the monkey and with the little, uh, keychain of Rollo Haynes. And then we get the reveal that she's, that her mother has been in her mind the whole time. And, uh, she rides off into, into the sunset. It's it's a nice ending. It's a really nice ending. And then we get the replay of uh, Always Something There to Remind Me, which has obviously much uh, more significant meaning to us now in the context of the episode. And uh, it's fun. It's a satisfying ending. It's a nice... It's It's kind of a nice, like, character rides off into the sunset kind of ending. And... I don't know. It's, it's, it's a fun, it's a fun ending. I liked it. Um, overall, I, even talking it out, I still don't think it's as, it's not as great as White Christmas. Um, White Christmas kind of blew me away a little bit, um, if memory serves, but, uh, and, but here, like, White Christmas felt like it was special in that it was, I mean, it was the first Christmas special that they did and the first extended episode and the first, kind of a feature length, like anthology feature length film kind of storyline that they did. And it worked really well because it felt special in that moment. And it felt so spectacularly tied together. Like all of the different storylines kind of fell folded into each other in an interesting way. And it, it kind of all tied together in a very cohesive way. Um, now though, with Black Christmas, it kind of feels like the show is, a little too, maybe it's a little too popular, honestly. Maybe it's just too, too much in the spotlight. Um, because it kind of feels like the show is kind of being a little too in on its own joke. Like it's, it's kind of, it's self-referential in ways that it doesn't really need to be self-referential. And, um, I think, I don't know if I would be comfortable saying that it's because of that, but, um, in, 
where it could be more tightly written and tightly paced instead of instead of tight writing we have uh little in jokes and easter eggs and uh ways to tie it back to past episodes and everything it just it feels a little too it feels a little too too much like the show's trying to be clever rather than tell a clever story if that makes sense um, but even with those caveats and those, those complaints, it's still a very solid and satisfying season ender for, uh, for Black Mirror. It's, uh, it's a fun episode. It's, it's satisfying. It has some interesting twists and turns, some disturbing, disturbing moments. Um, and overall it's pretty good. So that'll do it for my bonus review series of season four of Black Mirror. Uh, finally, it took me a freaking year and <laughs> like a year and three months, I think. I'm um, sorry about that, but uh, but yeah, we're we're done. Cool. Um, eventually, here in a few weeks, we'll do a review of Bandersnatch, uh, which I don't think technically counts as season four, so I think I'm okay there. But I'm gonna try to have Tiny on for it from Obsessive Viewer, and uh, we'll try to work that out and everything. And then before we know it, here in God, less than a month, less than a month, we're gonna get the new Twilight Zone uh, from Jordan Peele. I have already signed up for CBS All Access um, just in preparation for it, and just to kind of see what's on there and everything. I do want to kind of squeeze in Star Trek Discovery at some point, but anyway, um, super excited for that. I'll do another bonus review series and everything on the main feed coming up this week. Hopefully if I can get time to record and edit and everything, um, I'll be reviewing the invaders, Richard Matheson episode of the twilight zone from season two. Um, I've seen the episode. I've made my notes. Uh, <laughs> I'll go ahead and say it. It got me <laughs> like, <laughs> like I did not, I did not expect it to go the way that it did. And so I'm excited to talk about it on the podcast, uh, here in a few days. Um, yeah. So once again, if you like what you've heard and you want to help support the podcast, uh, check out, uh, anthologypod.com and click the donate button or go to patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. And, uh, also if, again, if you like what you heard, make sure you check out my other podcasts over at obsessive viewer.com. You can find those at obsessive viewer.com slash podcasts. I have, um, obsessive viewer, which is a just general movie and TV podcast. And then tower junkies, which is me and tiny talking about Stephen King and the dark tower series. So yeah, check those out at obsessive viewer.com slash podcasts. And yeah, that'll do it for my bonus review series of Black Mirror Season 4. And now, please, please join me in just hoping, and if you're a praying person, pray for it, uh, that they do not drop Season 5 while Twilight Zone is airing, because I will pull my hair out. Um, so let's hope that Season 5 of Black Mirror comes out long after Twilight Zone Season 1 ends. Um, I've got my fingers crossed on that. So anyway... Thank you guys so much for listening, and I'll see you next time. Anthology is edited and produced by Matt Hurt and presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. For a full archive of our episodes, go to AnthologyPod.com slash archive. You can also like the Facebook page at Facebook.com slash AnthologyPod. And follow the show on Twitter at OV Anthology Pod. If you enjoy the show, please take a couple minutes to leave us a rating and a quick review on Apple Podcasts. This is the easiest way to support what we do, and all it costs is a little bit of your time. If you'd like to donate to the podcast, you can make a PayPal donation at anthologypod.com slash donate, or support us on Patreon for recurring donations and access to commentary tracks and B-roll audio recorded exclusively for patrons at patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. Every donation goes toward paying the fees to keep the podcast running and is greatly appreciated. Official anthology merch, including shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more can be found in the Obsessive Viewer's Tee Public store. You can find a link to the store in the show notes of this episode and at anthologypod.com slash donate. Or you can simply search for Obsessive Viewer at tpublic.com. For information about the Obsessive Viewer's annual live event showcasing short horror films from local filmmakers, check out shocktoberinirvington.com. And for an archive of all our events, as well as news about potential future events, head over to obsessiveviewer.com slash live. 
For more podcast content, you can find our flagship movie and TV review and discussion show, The Obsessive Viewer Podcast, at obsessiveviewer.com and on Twitter at Obsessive Viewer. You can also find Tower Junkies, a podcast where Matt and co-host Tiny share their love of all things Stephen King and his magnum opus, The Dark Tower series, over at TowerJunkiesPod.com and at TowerJunkiesPod on Twitter. And finally, check out The Secular Perspective, Tiny's side project podcast, which tackles current events and life's big questions from the perspective of secular hosts Chad and Amanda at TheSecularPerspective.com. Bumper music for this podcast comes courtesy of As Good As It Gets, which can be found at facebook.com slash as good as it gets band. You can also find As Good As It Gets music on Spotify, Google Play, and iTunes. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.